how's it going YouTube? Welcome to Asian Filmless. My name is Ray and I love movies. And today, we just want to say Happy New Year. It's time to welcome in 2017. But you know, before we do that, we just wanted to take a look back at 2016 at some of our favorite moments in Japanese cinema. And so the movies I'm going to be talking about today are my 10 favorite Japanese films of 2016. So the keyword I just used is favorite. So that means I won't necessarily be talking about the 10 best highly critically acclaimed Japanese films of 2016, nor will I be talking about the highest grossing films. Instead, I'm going to be talking about my 10 favorite movies that came out of Japan last year. So needless to say, my list won't necessarily match up to everyone's list out there. So if your list differs in any way, shape, or form, leave a comment below and let us know. And without further ado, let's get on with it. Now, first of all, number 10, it's a bit of a light watch, a light and fun watch. Uh, and I think, you know, it kind of went under the radar with a lot of fans who live overseas who, you know, just kind of casual fans of Japanese cinema. And that movie is Gold Metal Man, directed by and starring comedian Uchimura Teruyoshi. Gold Metal Man is a comedy about the life of a boy named Senichi. And ever since he was an elementary school student, he's always been number one at pretty much everything he tries to accomplish. He's always got first place at running track, he's always won first place at calligraphy contests. But as soon as he becomes a junior high school student, he discovers girls. And slowly, you know, girls start taking away his mojo and starts losing. Even though he loses his mojo, he still tries new things and tries to be number one at all those new things all throughout his life. Now, Gold Metal Man, it stars a whole ensemble of talent, but it's led by Chinen Yuri as a young Seiichi and Uchimura, the director himself, as the adult Seiichi. And as Seiichi lives out his years, we in the audience get treated to whole loads of cameos featuring big names in Japanese cinema. And it's loads of fun when they pop in. It's like, hey, I know that guy. I definitely recommend it if you want something fun and comedic to watch. Next up at number 9 is Death Note Light Up the New World, uh, directed by Sato Shinsuke. You know, at first it was kind of tough choosing between Death Note Light Up the New World and also Sato's other hit, I Am a Hero, but in the end, I felt I was entertained a lot more with Death Note Light Up the New World. Death Note Light Up the New World is a sequel to the original Death Note film series, and the story takes place 10 years after the events of those movies. It stars Higashide Masahiro, Ikimatsu Sosuke, and Suda Masaki as the three lead characters. But not only that, it also also features a whole bunch of actors who uh, reprise their roles from the original movies. And so the story of Light of the New World is, well, first of all, if you don't know Death Note, it's about a supernatural notebook that whenever someone writes a name of a person in it, uh, that person dies. And in Light of the New World, it takes place 10 years after the events of the original movies. And it's also been 10 years since the last Death Note occurrence, but then suddenly um, some, a lot of murders start happening and they look like to be carried out by the Death Note. What I like about Death Note Light of the New World, you know, it's really intense, it's really gripping. The music, the soundtrack is absolutely amazing and it does well to keep you on the edge of your seat from beginning to end. Definitely recommend this movie if you're a fan of movies that, you know, the, that feel like they're totally a manga, or uh, if you're a fan of supernatural thrill and even crime dramas, this movie will appease your appetite. Next up at number 8 is the most recent drama by director Koreeda Hirokazu and that is After the Storm. After the Storm stars Abe Hiroshi as a man named Ryota who, you know, 15 years ago he received awards for his novel but now he works as a private detective trying to make ends meet. And you know, overall, he's kind of a dick. You know, he uh, he blackmails high school kids in order to make some small cash. He spends all his earnings away gambling. But at the same time, he kind of still wants to keep a relationship with his son. You know, it's a family drama. You know, it's about this disconnected family. And then one day, a typhoon approaches. And through some scheming, Ryota manages to get his ex-wife, his son, and his mother all under the same roof. And while all four family members are trapped waiting for the storm to pass by, Ryota tries to take this opportunity to try to reconnect with his estranged family. The movie dives into themes about nostalgia, uh, about looking into one's past mistakes, and reanalyzing how you would approach those situations again, and at the same time coming to terms with everything and just trying to move forward. And you know, it's it's a Koreeda movie. You know, his characters will just pull you in. It's really good. And next up at number seven, we have the new EY Shunji movie, The Bride of Rip Van Winkle. This movie stars Kuroki Haru, who's kind of this poor man's Aoi Yu. But you know, Despite that comment, Kuroki Haru really delivers in this movie. Kuroki stars as his girl Nanami, and basically she, 
that she is the most unlucky girl in the world. You know, she meets this guy through online dating, uh, but because she doesn't have any friends to show up at her wedding, she has to go through this kind of third party agency to kind of hire people to show up at her wedding to, you know, be a part of her family. And this agency is led by Ayano Go, who delivers another really interesting performance as well. But anyways, as Nanami goes on with her marriage, uh, she finds out that her husband has been cheating on her. But however, upon accusing her husband of the affair and presenting evidence as well, her husband's mother accuses Nanami herself of having an affair. And so Nanami has to find another job, and she finds a numerous part-time jobs thanks to Ayano Go's character. But finally, she lands a job as a live-in maid, where she meets Mashiro, who is played by singer-songwriter Koko. Now it seems like once Nanami lands his job as a live-in maid, all her bad luck uh, seems to be coming to an end. But of course, you know, life is full of twists. Now if you try to watch A Bride of Rip Van Winkle, one of the first things you'll probably notice is the runtime. It's three hours long. But you know, if you have the strength to sit through three hours of Iwai Shunji, then this movie is for you. Next up at number six, we have Scoop, directed by One Hitoshi. Now One, he's the director of one of my favorite films from 2015, and that is the Bakuman live action adaptation. And he certainly delivers again in this movie. Scoop stars Fukuyama Masaharu and Nikado Fumi in kind of this buddy comedy uh, revolving around a paparazzi cameraman. Fukuyama stars as Shizuka, who is a paparazzi for this tabloid called Scoop. And Nikaido stars as Nobi, who works as a writer for the same publication. And Shizuka is ordered by the chief to take Nobi under his wing and to take him through all his nightly escapades. The main thing I love about Scoop are the performances of the two leads. Fukuyama, he is so entertaining playing this dickish middle-aged paparazzi dude. And Nikaido, she's this rookie reporter. She wants nothing to do with Fukuyama's character. Now the relationship between the two leads is kind of a mix of things. You get the typical buddy comedy, you know, a la uh, Lethal Weapon, a rush hour. We also get a nice mentor-student relationship as Shizuka teaches Nobi the ropes. So yeah, check out Scoop if you enjoy buddy comedies and if you enjoy morally ambiguous characters. Next up at number five, we have 64, the two-part movie directed by Zeze Takahisa. To put it simply, uh, 64 refers to the 64th year of the Showa era. In the Western calendar, that's 1989. And in this year, here, a crime happens where a girl is kidnapped and murdered for ransom. However, the culprit was never found and 14 years pass and at this time, the statute of limitations is about to expire on this old case. Now 14 years takes us to 2002 where another crime pops up and it happens really similarly to this old case. The movie stars an ensemble of who's who in Japanese entertainment and it's all led by Sato Koichi. Now between parts 1 and 2, you know, part 2 I felt was a whole lot more entertaining. Part 1 focused on Sato's character Mikami and in the old 64 case he was the lead detective but now 14 years later he is the public relations secretary at the police department. The first movie mainly focuses on Mikami as he tries to repair this broken relationship between the police department and the and the press. But then when part 2 comes along and the new kidnapping case happens again that's when things get really really intense. But you know in actuality both movies are quite intense. Uh, both movies feature a lot of yelling uh, so be prepared to hear a lot of very loud voices. But the plot is full of twists and turns that will have you guessing all the way up until the end. It notes definitely stand out, you know, I feel like Japan isn't really known for delivering crime thrillers, but you know, here we are with 64 and it delivers quite nicely. Next up at number four, we have Rage, directed by Lee Sung Il. Now this is another ensemble piece and it stars a lot of big names too. Those names include uh, Ayano Go, Tsumabuki Satoshi, Miyazaki Aoi, Watanabe Ken, Matsuyama Kenichi, Hirose Suzu, so yeah, there's a lot of big names in this movie. So Rage is a story that divides the narrative into three different stories. But the story that ties them all together, it's a murder. A man brutally murders a married couple and writes the word Rage with their blood on the wall. And the man departs and gets plastic surgery and then moves somewhere off into Japan that we don't really know. And that takes us to the three different narratives. Each of these three stories feature one man who could possibly be the culprit. And it gets pretty intense because you have family members, loved ones, suspecting that, you know, the person they love could possibly be a murderer. And to turn up the volume a bit on the drama, you know, each of the three suspects, they're kind of drifters and, you know, they're not, they're kind of mysterious to both the audience and their loved ones. And it's pretty interesting when, you know, in the news report, then they show uh, a police sketch of who the suspect might possibly look like right now. It was actually an, an amalgam of the three actors, the three actors' faces who are presented to be the suspect. Really recommend this movie for fans who love depressing stories and for movies that really go out of their way to make you cry. All right, here we go. Top three. 
But you know, honestly, the next three movies I'm about to talk about, I could honestly rearrange these movies in different orders and still feel satisfied with the list. But here we go, at number three we have Shin Godzilla, directed by Anno Hideyaki, the guy who brought to the world Neon Genesis Evangelion. Now Shin Godzilla, at its center, it, you know, it's a typical Godzilla storyline. We've all seen many times before, you know, uh, a monster comes out of the sea and starts wrecking havoc uh, onto Japan. But one of the most interesting points about Shin Godzilla is its concept. Uh, the tagline is Japan versus Godzilla, basically reality versus fantasy. And it's kind of made with a tongue-in-cheek intention, showing how Japan would really tackle a crisis such as Godzilla. And, you know, there's a lot of political commentary behind Shin Godzilla. You know, it was originally made to reflect how slow the government acted when the March 11 disasters happened in the Tohoku region. And just the same in Shin Godzilla, the government takes forever to really acknowledge that Godzilla exists and to start taking action. And in the most Evangelion way possible, there's a lot of board meetings and a lot of talking. And you you get a lot of mixed opinions about the boardroom talking, you know, depending on who you talk to. I personally didn't like it, but I did enjoy the parts that featured Godzilla himself. And they remixed Godzilla a lot, you know, they gave him new powers, they gave him a really hideous new design. It was pretty damn cool. But yeah, Shin Godzilla featured some of the best Godzilla action we've seen in a while. Granted, it's only Godzilla in this movie. It doesn't feature any fighting with other monsters. And it also features some of the best CG that has ever been featured in any Japanese film to date. Definitely recommend this movie for fans of Godzilla and also for fans of Eva. All right, here we go with number two. Now, I wonder how many of you guys are gonna comment that I didn't put this movie at my number one, but there exists one movie that I did enjoy a bit more than this one. And at number two, we have Your Name, directed by Shinkai Makoto. Your Name features the vocal talents of Kamiki Ryunosuke and Kamishirai Shimone. And just to prove for how successful this movie is, well, first of all, a movie usually lasts in theaters here in Japan for about a month, two months, and Your Name, it came out in the movie theaters in August. It is now January and is, it is still playing in movie theaters. And the story of Your Name, it starts off as a lighthearted body swapping comedy between a boy in, the, in busy Tokyo and a girl in the quiet countryside. But then into the second act, the movie takes a really dramatic and dark turn, and that's when things start really getting interesting. But yeah, you'll hear a lot of praise about the movie's visuals, about the artwork, about the music, the soundtrack uh, performed by Radwin you know, and it deserves every praise that it gets. The movie is wonderfully animated, it is well performed. Like each of the two lead actors, they kind of have to play two different characters too. They have to play a more feminine and more masculine version of both of the lead characters. But yeah, check out your name if you love animated movies, if you just love good movies, if you love good movies that feature really good music, I can't say the word good enough. I'll just say it's really awesome. Yeah, check out your name, definitely. And here we go, number one. The movie I enjoyed the most in 2016, and that is Museum, directed by Otomo Keishi. Now, Otomo Keishi, you might remember his work in the form of the live action adaptations of Rurouni Kenshin. Museum is a suspense thriller based on a manga. You know, well, you know, I really didn't know there was a comic, but you know, this movie, you can just watch it and still enjoy it nonetheless. The movie stars Oguri Shun and Sumabuki Satoshi and Oguri, he plays a detective who tracks down these series of murders that only happen in the rain for some reason. But they're carried out by this strange mysterious man in a frog mask. What I like about Museum is that it is brutal, it's really intense, and the performances by the two lead characters are outstanding. Like I think we've seen Oguri Shun act pretty rugged at, in the same way he did in Museum, but I don't think we've ever seen a performance by Tsumabuki as he did in this movie. Tsumabuki's performance, you know, both his look and his his acting were almost unrecognizable as he plays a pretty damn different character from what he usually has been playing in the past. And the story itself, it's dark, it's rugged, it's dirty, it's violent, you know, but it doesn't go too over the top so that way it becomes blood porn. But still be prepared to feel squeamish and uncomfortable with every scene of violence and gore in this film. And yeah, from beginning to end, you'll be biting your nails. This movie was that intense. And so there you go. Those are my 10 favorite Japanese films of 2016. And as I said before, many of my films will differ from yours. So whatever your top 10 Japanese films 2016 are, let us know in the comments below. And yeah, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to Asian Filmist for more reviews and discussions on Asian films. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And if you sign up for our email newsletter, you can receive a free copy of our ebook, The 108 Asian Films for New Fans to Watch. And once again, my name is Ray. You can find me on Twitter at RayMaru555. And yeah, that's about it, everyone. All right, guys, I'm about to watch another movie. I'll be back soon, yeah? Promise. Oh, and Happy New Year.